All right, Bible readers, I am glad you're here. Today is a summary of Romans chapter 13. If this is your first time here, I'm doing a summary of each chapter from Acts through Philemon. And today's chapter happens to be the shortest chapter in the book of Romans. It's only 14 verses, and I'm subtitling it, How to Navigate Our Pagan Wicked Leadership. Let me read a couple of verses. Romans 13, 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So here's a question for you. If you're looking at my screen watching this video, do these verses mean you do that which is against your conscience or violate clearly defined doctrine? I say God forbid. In other words, if, if you... Of course, if you yank these two verses out of context and just and just treat them like, oh, they just stand on their own, then that would mean that no matter what, you you don't ever resist power and you don't ever resist, um, you know, the the higher powers that he speaks of in verse one. Okay, and and then you just have to go on your life like that. But then ask yourself, does that make any sense in the in the context of the entire Bible or even within the context of the Book of Romans? And I say, there's no way that that does. That, do, that doesn't work. But that is, there are people that kind of take that extreme position. That like, no matter what, you got to follow the laws of the land. Well, I say, when you, when you actually take the time to read the entire chapter of Romans 13 and all of Paul's books and indeed all of the Bible, then you understand that that is a ridiculous position and nothing trumps God's law. Okay, so let's keep going. But but what I want to say is something that I say quite a bit. Issues like this are exactly why I say that this is the entire context. Okay, it's fine to talk about context in relation to like the verse before and the verse after, or maybe an entire passage or whatever. But ultimately, this thing is the entire context. And if you've never read the entire thing, then today's the day to start. If you need a reading schedule, let me know. I'll give you one. It's super easy. It's a five-day-a-week reading program. Puts you through the Bible, the entire Bible, in about, I think it's uh, 50 weeks, something like that. Gives you lots of time off in between, around holidays, things like that, so that gives you the weekends off. So it just prevents fail points. I've been using it for years. I, As far as I, I know, I'm the one that created it. Um, I, I don't see anything like this on the internet. Okay, let's move on. So what I want to say here is there's never a question as to whether we should obey one of these higher powers when they command a thing plainly contrary to the law of God. So in other words, let me say this a different way. There is nothing in Paul's writings here or anywhere else in any of his other 12 books that should give us the idea that we should break the laws of God to follow the laws of the land. Okay. And so there's a couple of verse, three verse references there, Romans 7.22, 7.25, and 8.7 <clears throat> that you can go look at to put, you know, put some perspective on that. But let's keep moving. But one more example here, Acts 5.29 says, Then Peter and the, the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Well, yeah. Okay. And yes, I realize for, for those that might be watching this that are rightly dividing the word of truth along dispensational lines, you might be going, but that's Acts chapter five. Yeah, I get it. I'm with you. But I also think that you probably understand what I'm saying. If you're a rightly dividing, you know, Paul following kind of person, then you probably get what I'm saying. But if you don't, let's, let's talk about that. I'd love to have that conversation. All right, so the question Paul was addressing was, should we obey a pagan, wicked politician at all? Okay, so you see the difference? Should we obey the laws of the land? That's, that's one kind of question. Should we obey the laws of the land? Or should we, should we obey the laws of the land at all? See the difference in those two questions? And so I think that what Paul was saying here is that 
we should strive to do the best that we can to obey the laws of the land, but not when it causes us to go against our own conscience or the laws of God. Okay. And there's lots of examples I could give you, but let's let's use something simple. You know, speeding limit laws. Okay, the right to drive on a road is you know it's a it's a right because you know taxpayer money had to pay for the road or whatever. And okay, so I'm not going to go down that road too far. But there's there's laws, and if you exceed the speed limit, you get pulled over, and you have to pay a fine. Okay, fine. I, I don't have any problem with that. But when Let's just say, you know, some other extreme example, which, you know, we're probably not too far off from these things, kinds of things happening. It's already happening around the world. But when, if, if law enforcement comes to my house and says, you can't have this Bible. Well, those are fighting words. And that goes against my conscience. And I will not obey the laws of the land. Okay, so those are maybe two extreme examples. Speeding, which, you know, relatively trivial. And then, you know, the higher power is coming to take away God's word from me. Kind of extreme examples, but it's it's just to make the point that somewhere there's a balance in, you know, we should do our best to follow the laws of the land, to, to be good citizens or whatever, to make peace, those kinds of concepts, but not if it goes against the law of God or our own conscience. All right. Um, and so having said that, you know, just, just, you know, to kind of clear that up and in, in what I wrote here, I believe in the greater context of Paul's writings and the Bible as a whole, the answer to should we obey a pagan wicked politician at all? The answer is yes. It sounds kind of, sounds kind of weird when I say it that way, right? Pagan wicked politician, but you know, that's the way that I view them. You know, I don't care if you're talking about Biden or Trump. They're those guys. Those guys are so messed up. And, and don't don't come at me saying, "Oh, Trump's a Christian." I may, hey, look, that's between him and God. But if if that's the best America has to offer, well, no wonder we're in trouble. Okay. All right, let's move on. But only within the limits of that which does not violate our conscience or the law of God. Okay, I'm getting redundant. So. I think greater context is critical for understanding. And again, that's why I say this thing is the context. In 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul admonished us to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, and that we should not entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life. And, and, the, and, the, and the why, like, okay, so Paul says this in verse 3, and, and part of verse 4 but it kind of begs the question, why? Why should we be good soldiers of Jesus Christ and endure hardness and not get caught up in the affairs of this life? Why? Well, we don't have to guess. Verse 4 says, so that we can please him that should have chosen us to be a good to be a soldier. That's Jesus Christ. If you're a child of God, you are called to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And so that entails enduring hardness and not getting caught up or entangled in the affairs of this life. Politics is definitely an affair of this life. Jesus Christ didn't look at Jesus Christ's life. Look at Paul's life. They didn't, they never, they never talked about politics. They referenced it. Jesus Christ referenced it a little bit. Paul's referencing it a little bit here, but only hinting at it. He's saying. Another way of maybe expressing it with, with what Paul is trying to teach here is that try to live peaceably with political stuff in as much as you can. But but honestly, I think I think what Paul's deeper message here is that you know we should we should stay out of political disputes and taking an active part in political controversy. In my personal opinion, and, and really I'm taking into consideration a historical perspective over my lifetime. Christians have been taken advantage of and, and really just made look made look foolish by putting their hand to such things. Hey, when I was young, when, when George Bush Jr. ran the first time, it was the first time I voted for president. And part of the reason was because 
he sang a pretty good song about he was going to overturn Roe v. Wade. And I thought, well, you know, that makes sense. And I had no clue what being a good soldier of Jesus Christ was back then. And I was all caught up in political affairs and blah, blah, blah. And so I thought, hey, this is the man. I'm going to vote him in. Well, guess what? Two terms. Two terms. He never touched Roe v. Wade. Isn't that crazy? But he played to his Christian front. Oh, boy. Even though his wife was all into, you know, wickedness and seances and so was he, right? So, yeah, I got fooled by President Reagan or President Bush. Reagan, Reagan's the one that had the wife that was in the seances. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at both on my screen. The point is, I got fooled at a younger age thinking that, that Bush was, was going to do something important. You know, um, I remember when Reagan was president before I could vote, you know, um, Christians were falling all over themselves about Reagan, you know, talking about how he was a good Christian man, blah, blah, blah. Well, meanwhile, his, his wife was running seances in the White House. Yeah. Maybe you've never heard that before. It's easy enough to research. Google it up. She was famous for it. So, you know, in my opinion, I think Trump is, is a current example of a political figure that's making Christians look stupid. He's using, he's using a Christian base, a naive, ignorant Christian base to, you know, fuel his campaign. Now, I'll say this, and I don't, I don't have any hesitation to say this. I voted for Trump. I hadn't voted, look, I hadn't voted for president since the last time that George Bush ran the first time, okay? What I referenced just a few minutes ago. That was the last time I voted for president until Trump ran the first time. And I voted for him, not because I thought he was gonna save the world or I was on the Trump train or anything, any of that nonsense. I was wise enough by then to know who Trump was and who he is still to this day, okay? I'm not judging the guy between him, he and his relationship with God. What That's that's between him and God. But, but I am not on any kind of crazy Trump train and thinking he's gonna save the world. The only reason I voted for him was because I knew he would stir the pot. And frankly, I wanted, I, I wanted to put my hand to that to just see it. And he did. He stirred the pot real good. Is America better off for it? No, no, no not, but not by any means. And even if he wins this time, he's not, Trump's not going to save America. Okay. Get over it. America is doomed. And all you Pentecostal charismatic types, if you know anybody like that, they're crazy. They're out of their mind. They think, they, they, they think that God's going to bring a revival to America. Well, they're just nuts. All right. So I believe the Apostle Paul wished to keep Christians from such doubtful dispute, disputations. You know, things like deciding between Biden and Trump. I'm not voting this time. I don't care anymore. Again, I voted for Trump the first time because I thought ah, he's going to stir the pot up and I want to see this. I want to make sure that that happens just so I can see it. Well, he did and whatever, you know. Uh, this time, don't care. Doesn't make any difference. I'm not voting. So let's move on. Romans 13, 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to, evil, to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Okay, that's a big mouthful. Again, I hope that you're reading these chapters on your own and, and you know, reading a little slower, but what the point I want to make here is that Paul was obviously saying rulers are not a terror to good works as a general statement. This is not some hard and fast thing, you know, and I think this is where people get messed up is they're like, well, see, Paul said that, you know, these, these, these rulers are not a terror to good works. Again, he's speaking in general terms. 
because the reality is, you know, probably if you lined up most politicians and most government leaders, you know, at the state level, federal level, you know, whatever part of the world you live in, whatever the different degrees of, of government are, you know, I'm going to say probably statistically, most of them mean well, like they have good intentions. Yeah, maybe they're taking a little money on the side or they're working some deal to help, you know, whatever. But I mean, I think in general, they want whatever society they're governing, gov governing, govern, governing, yeah, governing to be better in some way. I think for the most part, that's true. But the reality is, is that it's the ones that really have evil intentions that end up, you know, um, what's the right way to say it? They, they end up making the most changes. And so, you know, over the years of my life, I've watched, you know, the right, the, the Republican right, so to speak, because I used to identify, you know, when I was younger and kind of stupid, naive, I used to identify as Republican. But what I've watched is that if, if, if this hand re represents the Republicans and this hand represents the left, you know, the, the, the Democrats or whatever, if, if the Democrats become more liberal, well, the Republicans don't become more conservative. They just become a little more liberal too. And the liberals become a little more liberal and the Republicans become a little more liberal. Okay, and it just keeps moving like this. It's just a little steeplechase, right? And so you can talk to any political pundit or political analyst or whatever, and they'll tell you that Democrats in the 60s were, were far more conservative than Republicans are today. You see? So it's just proof that it's it's the it's the the left. It's the liberals that have been dragging everything forward. So Trump being in office for four years, oh yeah, it creates a little bubble, kind of stalls out the, the liberal shift a little bit maybe. But then, but then, you know, liberals get back in and like, ooh, there's, there's a big correction, right? And now we've just gone completely off the deep end. But we're not completely at the bottom of the deep end yet. But it's coming. All right, so... Again, Paul was obviously not saying that, you know, that just broad sweeping, you know, black and white definitive, you know, rulers are not a terror to good works. Okay, we know it's a general statement because otherwise you'd have to say that the Apostle Paul was condoning the works of men like Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, and arguably even Biden and Trump. Okay, and that, again, in the context of, of Paul's writings and the Bible in general, that would be pretty stupid, wouldn't it? Verse six, for this cause, pay ye tribute. Okay, I think I think tribute generally in, in our terms means taxes and other types of things, fees, assessments, whatever, right? And that's ideally under ideal circumstances or at least the intent of those fees and taxes and levies and that things like that is for the betterment of society. You know, again, we all like to drive on paved roads without potholes. Well, that comes from taxes and other things fees and things like that so uh some of that's good also for they are god's ministers attending continually upon this very thing render therefore to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is due custom to whom custom fear whom fear honor to whom honor okay again generally speaking right so what about when those taxes go to support abortion or drug running or human trafficking? What about that? How do we deal with that in our lives? It's a tough one. I'm not going to answer that here. I'm just putting it out there as a question. Romans 13, 8. Oh, no man, anything. Yeah. Hey, being debt free is a beautiful thing. I like it personally. I've, I've been in debt and I've been debt free like I am now. And I like being debt free. It brings a certain lightness to your life that is like none other. 
but but to love one another. So owe no man anything but to love one another. So in other words, think about that. Paul's saying you owe somebody else your love. That's the only debt we should have is, is our debt to one another to love them. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Yeah. Romans 13, 9. If you look at my screen, I broke this down. Didn't change any of the words. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Now ask yourself, I, I want you to be thinking, why is Paul reciting the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, what's interesting here is why did he only mention six? And most notably, he left out the whole issue of Sabbath. So again, not answering that here. This is a summary of Romans 13. I just want to provoke you to get into your Bible and ask yourself and try to answer some of these questions for yourself. The reason I ask questions without answering them oftentimes is because if I answer them or if I just, well, let me deal with one at a time. If I answer them, then people go, well, no, that's not true because this verse, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's fine. But if I just ask the question and encourage you to get into the Bible to answer the question for yourself, okay, that's a whole different thing. The other reason I ask a lot of questions is because telling is not selling. And my goal here at Quick Bible Study is to sell you on the idea of getting into the Word of God for yourself and answering your own questions. Okay? Don't be afraid to ask me a question because I'd love to have that conversation. But don't come to me with 35 questions and expect me to answer all your questions because I will just drive you right back into your Bible. But I'll help you. I will definitely help you. And I will love you by helping you. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Yeah, love is our highest calling. Well, what is love? Okay. What is love? Was Jesus fulfilling the law when he cast out all of them and overthrew the tables of the money changers? Remember the story in Matthew? It's in Mark as well. It's in Luke as well. For some reason, John doesn't tell the story. Isn't that interesting? Matthew 21, 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. So... Yeah, I'm not going to get into it. The, the, the question, though, is did, did Jesus Christ, was he fulfilling the law of love by going in there and tossing tables and kicking people out and all that? Was that love? Is there anything in your spirit that's kind of struggling with it? Like, oh, that's just not the Jesus I want to think about or whatever. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious what you're experiencing as you think about Jesus going in. You know, the, the text doesn't speak to this, but a, lo a lot of pictures have Jesus with a whip or whatever. Well, I don't, I don't know where that comes from because the Bible doesn't, doesn't indicate that at all. In fact, this is, this is all it says. Matthew 21, 12 is, is all it says in terms of like his actions in the temple. But obviously there was some degree of, you know, I, know, I think violence is probably a too, it's too strong of a word, but you know, he was, he was definitely flipping tables over and, and, you know, casting people out of the temple and, and that kind of thing. So I'm sure it was perceived as some degree of violence. And I think a lot of people struggle with this image of Jesus. You know, people, people like to think of Jesus as, you know, sitting next to a lamb and, you know, singing Kumbaya or whatever. But Jesus was a warrior and he was a man's man. And he saw people doing something that they shouldn't have done in his temple. All right, Romans 13, 11. And that, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Yeah. It's real popular today. Everybody thinks they're awake. My question is, awake to what? I mean, I think 
I think because of the information age, you know, we all live in this age where, you know, we can, we can put whatever information we want in front of our eyes and think that, oh, we're awake. Well, I say awake to what? And look, Christian, if you haven't read this whole thing more than once, you're not awake. You're, you're in sleepy land thinking that John 3, 16 is the gospel and not really sure what, you know, what the word dispensation means. And, you know, you don't really like some of the things Paul says because your pastor said this or that or whatever, and you're still tithing. And so you, it, it's time to wake up for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Well, yeah, at the moment that we believed and trust in Jesus Christ, you know, at any moment we can die and be redeemed and, and all that. So um, now is definitely time to wake up. It has always been high time to wake out of sleep. Yeah. All right. Verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I want to break this down a little bit. So I love this contrast between the works of darkness and the armor of light. Doesn't get any better than that. I put some verse references there, Ephesians 5, 1, and it's really the chapter of Ephesians. It's almost broken in half in terms of setting up this explanation of the works of darkness and then explaining in an expanded way the armor of light. So Romans 13, 13 says, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Okay, I definitely want to expand this a little bit. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it got me to think, it, it, it sounds like take unto you the whole armor of God. This, this idea of putting something on, you know, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Take unto you the whole armor of God. So in Ephesians 6.13, it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand um, in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And so, let me ask you a question. What's the first piece of the armor of God? If you're looking at my screen, you have the answer. It's truth. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. That's the first piece of the armor of God. And that sure sounds like the truth that Jesus referred to himself as in John 14, 6, where he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that truth sure sounds like the word that John spoke of in John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So let me ask you, Christian, when you're holding this book in your hand, what are you really holding? Is it just a book? What is it to you? To me, it's the living word of God. When I read it, it reads me. It kicks my religion in the teeth. Tells me who I am. Good and bad. That's why it's called, it's referred to as a uh, the, the sharper than any two-edged sword. A two-edged sword can cut you both ways. So one cut can be the kind of cut where it's kicking your religion in the teeth. The other cut can mean refining something in you and showing you who you are. And so we need to, we need to our, avail ourselves to this living document. All right, that's all I got for you. I hope you got some encouragement out of this. Please share it. Please subscribe to the channel. And I hope that you have a good Bible read. I'll see you on the next video.